Thank you, Elizabeth. And, uh, thank you to, to Jahan for, for the invitation and to Peter Miller for all the organizational work that went into this event. Um, it's always a, a, a special delight for me to return to UVA where I have so many former students, old friends, collaborators, and others. Uh, and uh, especially congratulations on the establishment of this center. It's such a happy occasion, not only for UVA, but for the world. In 1663, at about the same time that John Milton was composing Paradise Lost as a work of inspiration, and Margaret Cavendish, the Duchess of Newcastle, was conceiving her prose fiction, The Blazing World, as a kind of manifesto of fancy or imagination. The Spanish Cistercian monk, Juan Caramuel Lobkowitz, interesting character of uh, born in Madrid of Polish and uh, uh, German ancestry, published a voluminous book entitled Primus Calamus Ab Oculus Ponens Metametricum Quae Variis Corintium Recorintium Abscendentium Descendentium Necumon Circumulantium Versum Nubibus Multiformes Labyrinthos Exornat, or as we call it for short, the Metametrica. Mm -hmm. This is, by the way, the best title ever for a book about flags. I'm going to use it for something before I'm done. Um, this tome, the Metametrica, was the third part in a trilogy following the partly published Grammatica, a treatise on all the languages of the world, and Rhythmica, uh, with which Metametrica was printed, and the borders between the latter two books, because they're bound together in the 1663 edition, uh, the borders between these two works can sometimes be hard to discern. Caramuel served for many years as a bishop in Italy. He died in that office at Vigivano in Lombardy. He was a philosopher, mathematician, musician, and jurist, among other intellectual identities. His Metametrica is an ars poetica that in some ways resembles influential treatises of the Renaissance, such as Julius Caesar Scaliger's Poeticus, 1561, George Putnam's Art of English Poesy, 1589, and Juan Diaz and Gifo's Arte Poetica Española, 1592. Like them, the Metametrica addresses first principles, evaluates genres, and, as so often in the period, responds to attacks on the art. At the same time, the Metametrica is distinctive for its elementalism, which, which, by which I mean the way it dissolves features of poetry that we readers experience as indivisible into discrete named elements. Thus, at the start of the volume, Caramuel asks, quid in cursu humaniorum literarum continuator expendo? What is contained in the course of humane letters I consider? And answers himself, litera, lingua, tropus, numerus, tonus, angulus, and astrum. The latter two are not the ones you expect as a modern reader. Uh, angles as in geometry and, and stars. A table of elements that he then breaks into their elements. For instance, litera includes orthography, polygraphy, and steganography. I know you know what that means. It means the, a, a message hidden within another message. Lingua is grammar and rhythm. Tropus is rhetoric. In a section called Prodromus Metametricus, uh, Prodromus as in a kind of preamble or a kind of uh, uh, preliminary document, composed in both Italian and Spanish, each of these terms, that list that I just mentioned, is anatomized in turn, sometimes in disconcerting detail. Under orthography, for example, Conwell begins by observing that the letters we use are these, A, B, C, etc. And then he goes on to give the names of the letters as if they were words. So he does it in Spanish and Italian, but if we were doing it in English, it's like we would, we would write A phonetically, B, B, E, E, C, so that you know not 
not only, in effect, he's opening this kind of conceptual space between the, um, the name of a letter in writing and the same name in speech. And to me, this represents his elementalist outlook, according to which no feature of a poem is too small or inconsequential to merit mention, no taxonomy is too trivial, and no pattern lacks meaning. In little, the elementalism of the Metametrica displays a wealth of scholarly observation about linguistics, prosody, metrics, and the material dimensions of artifice. And in large, it means that this is one of the few treatises on poetics of the period that concerns itself with the poem more than with poetry. When we converse with the representative statements on poetics of the 16th and 17th centuries, the orientation of, say, Philip Sidney in the influential Apology for Poetry composed in the early 1580s is common. The Apology is a defense of the art in which no poem appears in its entirety and only a few are cited at all. Preoccupied with justifying the place of poetry in culture, it scarcely addresses the question, how does one write a poem, much less, what is a poem? Another late 16th century treatise that survived in manuscript and in a new modern edition, The Model of Poetry by William Scott, the great grandson of Sir Thomas Wyatt, proposes a set of abstract principles to be found in good poems. Perspicuity, purity, fullness, plentifulness, softness, and above all, sweetness. And demonstrates them with excerpts from many poems. But consonant with his era, Scott imagines the poem as realized down from ideals rather than up from material features. Even a theorist as concrete as Putnam whose second and third books in the Art of English Poesy memorably identify schemes, as in this rhyme scheme, tropes, and strophes, hardly attends to the still more elemental patterns that constitute early modern poems. It's another of Putnam's famous uh, displays of gross uh, stanza forms in, in, in terms of their visual shapes. In contrast, Cottonwell's counter-reformation metaphysics is inclined toward not only patterns in poems, but physical, labile, visceral features that reveal great truths in humble terms. In this spirit, he makes the commonplace observation in introducing the vowels during the aforementioned treatment of orthography that A-E-I-O-U, or V, spelled Jehovah. Lots of people say this in the period. But we notice that his mystical and materialist motives are practically inseparable from each other. I'd like to suggest that Cottonwell's intellectual formation in theology and mathematics makes him probably the most thoroughgoing materialist poetician of the period, even if for his poetics, artifice is never an end in itself. And still, one can certainly be pardoned for losing sight of this principle. So for example, Cottonwell likes to speculate on the differences between words that use assonance of A and E, and those that depend on E and O, and so on and so on, and provides copious lists of each kind of word for the poet to choose from. He discusses words that begin and end with various letters, shown in lists by the hundreds. Lines that begin with common words, quando, and he has 15 lines from Horace that begin with quando. Uh, and uncommon words, juvenile's use of uh, fiche dula, fiche dula, which is the name of a small bird. Most strikingly to me, he encourages his reader to imagine conceits for the poem as a dynamic event that extend well beyond the stock metaphors of homes, mirrors, and worlds that are common in this period. So, does a poem, a given poem, manifest a long-running, continuous discourse within a kind of narrow syntactic template. Perhaps it should be rendered imaginatively as a book role, modeled on the roles that preceded the Codex, with four columns that define its grammatical and syntactic possibilities. Or should the poem develop variation in centrifugal fashion, where lines begin in an aphora and then display more changes syntagmatically lines begin in an aphra and then display more variations as they
they move outward. So the, the, a given line has more possibilities the farther out it moves. Or <coughs> should a line should a line begin um, should the should a line uh, be, be, start to have it have, or use epistrophe? That is uh, the opposite of anaphora, where uh, the same thing comes at the end of every line and work inward from there. What he's trying to get you to do is imagine different versions of uh, possible beginnings, possible endings, varying arrangements of fundamental features. Might we imagine the varying arrangements of fundamental features such as feet or rhymes in terms of the patterns they evoke as different sorts of stars or flowers or even as a cube that lends dimensions to the Italianate conceit of stanzas as pretty rooms. What about the kind of poem known in the period as a labyrinth, in which a first line, here based on the alternation of 13 principles, such as perfection and piety, is changed by subtraction and addition until 13 lines later, the first line has been reversed. Might these visually and experientially rich ways of conceiving poems yield not only novelty and originality through constraint in the matter in the manner of say the Unipo group of, since 1960, but a renewed intellectual horizon for poetry itself. The heart of the Metametrica is a run of 34 chapters that give substance to Caramel's sense of poetry as embodied in actual poems in the process of becoming material and spiritual at once. This embodiment is captured in the title of the chapters, each of which is named after Apollo, as though it sifts superstitiously through the remains of Apollonian transfigurations in search of something that endures. Starting from the fundamentals of poetry, the chapters include Apollo Rhythmicus, Apollo Metricus, Apollo Ambiguous, Apollo Acrosticus, Apollo Misosticus, Apollo Arithmeticus, Apollo Fluens, Apollo Refluens, Apollo Wolans, Apollo Anagrammaticus, Apollo Anasyllabus, Apollo Analexicus, Apollo Anametricus, Apollo Steganographicus, and Apollo Polyglottus. Each chapter is divided into sections called Musa Musa, Musa in which Caramuel makes and unmakes poems according to the principle at hand. In Apollo Arithmeticus, Musa section 2 considers the numbers hidden within words, finding the then current year 1634 in the third line of Psalm 51 as written in Latin. In other words, it goes through the line of Latin. When it's M, it's, it's you know, MC as Roman numerals. Um, Musa 9 explains numeric systems that assign numbers to letters according to a logic of increase or decrease. Thus, A may correspond to 1, 500, or 1,000 in various systems, while Z may be a correspondingly small or large number in the same systems. Apollo Anagrammaticus offers 140 lines in which each word begins with one of the letters of Caramel's name. For instance, Iste omnem quique ad rem ad mult, aut multis utilis est lux. But the occasional feats of over-ingenuity and solipsism even cannot be distinguished from Caramel's project of showing poems made and unmade as though to distinguish elements and free the spirit from the body. Apollo Cantonarius expounds on the advantages of the cento, a poem made entirely of lines from other poems, and concludes with a brilliant cento fashioned entirely from heavy sticks drawn from the entire range of Virgil's poetry. That is, every half line is from something different, and he concocts it beautiful poem that makes sense. And Apollo Paroticus offers parodies of lines from Ovid, Virgil, Horace, and others through substitutions of words, often minutely different substitutions that modulate the semantics and tone of the original. Within this plan of Apollo chapters and Musa sections, Conwell addresses the works of classical and vernacular poets in Spanish, Flemish, Dutch, and German, he converses with critics such as Scaliger, and he analyzes genres such as epitaph and epithelium. 
The complement to the Apollo chapters are two procedural poems that join many of Cottonwell's interests in poetic making and unmaking, and in subtle modulations that produce stark differences. I'm going to show you both of these procedural poems and then come back and talk about the first one. Poem in honor of Jesus, built like a wheel, and its counterpart, a poem in honor of the Virgin Mary, on the same principle. Because the images are so small, let me let me uh, blow up the Jesus poem for you a little bit. Envision is not as a poem on the page, but in three dimensions, as a kind of workshop or laboratory in which a line of poetry is made and unmade, and the entire poem is constructed in turn. Like a roulette wheel, every one of the concentric circles can be turned to bring a different, different elements of the line into alignment with each other. And by the way, this must be one of the earliest diagrams in European culture of what Roman Jacobson called the poetic function, which pr projects the principle of equivalence from, as you know, the principle of equivalence from the axis of selection to the axis of combination. These are your axes of selection, and these are your axes of combination. It's a, it's a diagram of, of the poetic function. Moving outward from the unitary center, which is the name Jesus, the number of possible choices increases in each larger circle from 12 to 24 to 36 to 48 to 60, 72, and 84. There are over 180 billion possible lines here. A riot of freedom that takes place only within a setting of constraint. Any line, any one line that we can imagine is free within the conception of this wheel, but only one is free at a time, while all the others are therefore locked into place. Moreover, every expression of devotion that can be posited through the poem is revealed as having billions of alternate versions, not only because of God's glory, but because the mind of the poet accommodates them. And we're obliged to notice that the poem is finally a representation not of Jesus, but of that human mind, Cottonwell's mind, our minds, realized as a thinking poem. Against the background of much canonical poetic theory of his time, and in the context of the Metametrica, Cottonwell's experiment exists on the threshold of a new understanding of the poem. Now, there's one word that does not appear in the Metametrica. It cannot appear there because it wasn't used yet. But it will come to illuminate much of what we observe in his book, Baroque, or in Cottonwell's Spanish, Baroque. To take a step back, I understand the Baroque as a development out of and a reaction against the humanist styles of literature, art, and social organization that dominated the 16th century. As I often say, explain to my students, think, I think of the Baroque as humanism 2.0. <laughs> the powerful humanism of the 15th and 16th centuries is about describing a rational world with humankind at the center of God's creation. Humanism involves a set of technologies, movable type, linear perspective, and so on, and value systems, the cultivation of the classics, the invention of the humanities, that allow human beings to exchange their points of view with one another without necessarily referring everything back to God. Think of the paintings of Leonardo da Vinci and Raphael, the architecture of Palladio, the sculpture of Michelangelo, the imaginary worlds of Thomas More, in all of these, classical elements and models from Greece and Rome have been adapted to modern uses, and there's a rational order with human beings at the center. To oversimplify greatly, after about 1600, this phase of the Renaissance draws to a close. Science becomes less abstract and more empirical and eventually experimental. Technology flourishes. Geographical discoveries become less common. And for Europeans, the new world enterprise becomes a matter of maintaining a balance within a world of fixed dimensions with a great deal of social and economic instability. And, of course, in Europe, the absolutist political order, under threat from economic instability and religious divisions, imposes very strict controls on most forms of social and political life, but allows certain spheres, for instance, the theater, to thrive. So to put ourselves back in the Baroque moment that Cottonwell lived through from the beginning of his life, think of a social and political world that is closing rather than opening, but a regime of knowledge that is expanding. How will the latter 
fit with the new former? Will it explode? Moreover, the balance between the classics and modernity has changed since the 16th century as one pillar of classical disciplinary knowledge after another, astronomy, physiology, geography, and so forth, has been rendered nearly obsolete in its classical uh, understanding by the accumulating uh, pressure of modern discoveries. Therefore, people of the wealth generation think very differently than the people of the middle to late 16th century because they start to ask, they start to look at the scope of contemporaneous knowledge and they start to ask, what if we are the classics? Think of Galileo improving the telescope right after 1600 and the consequent realization that spreads across Europe are all of those things that we can see through the telescope worlds just like this one. Hence the Baroque. It represents a challenge to humanist orthodoxy through the forms, structures, and details that we name under the rubric of artifice. Through artifice, the Baroque flirts with insubordination, incommensurability, and disorder. It depends upon formal balance among many elements, but under threat of imbalance, a sense of dynamic movement even in static media, and an emotional con connection to the viewer or reader. That flash of uncertainty during which artists wonder how to de domesticate new realities into a classical order, how to render disproportionate proportionate, how to fashion a new big picture that can accommodate all the details, is the Baroque intuition. And as we all know, Baroque art, for that reason, Baroque art moves us, changes us, sometimes repels us. The manifest differences between Cottonwell and his earlier counterparts I've mentioned today, from Scaliger to Scott, involve not only orientations and generations that are changing, but worldviews in which ideas about the poem are entirely unfolded. His granular, often obsessive attention to artifice, his determination to show how poems are made and unmade, and his provision of a sometimes unimaginably large inventory of possibilities against the horizon of a faith that will somehow hold it all together and produce truth out of too much knowledge, produce conviction out of too many doubts, produce the poem out of too much artifice. These are the controlling principles of Cottonwell's Baroque poetics. In the Metametrica, we witness the end of the Renaissance poem and the beginning of something that, for its elementalism and dynamism, becomes increasingly recognizable all the way through the middle 20th century of, say, Roman Jakobson, Octavio Paz, Augusto de Campos, and Veronica Forrest Thompson, to name four people that we might think of as, as belonging to that mid-century generation. In the microscopic observations and feverish taxonomies of this, in many ways, mystical, antiquarian, and ultimately, most important, Baroque poetics, we encounter a modern answer to the question, what is a poem? Thank you.